All right. So, so who, who knows what song this is? Nobody? What? Come on, Roxy Music. You people should know these things. All right. Um, thank you so much, uh, David, and thanks so much, everybody. I, I have a ton of stuff to get through. I just sort of crammed it all full, so I'm, I'm going to go and blow through it. Please, um, in true Regeneron fashion, if there's anything you see while I'm talking that's interesting or I'm going too fast or uh, it's not clear enough to stop me. Um, so first and foremost, I, I took some feedback from Angela that uh, this talk was good, but didn't have enough cats, so I added a cat. Um, but OK, so what I'm going to talk about is first, I'll explain a little bit uh, some of what David was talking about with the RGC vision. Like, what is the Regeneron Genetics Center? What is it trying to do? And then I'll get a little bit into some of the details about the kind of drug development side. So I'm going to tell a little story about what we've done in terms of looking at related individuals in the Geisinger cohort <laughs> to try to understand human knockouts better, which is fundamentally important for trying to identify new targets. And then I'll talk a little bit about sort of a precision medicine story, which is more in the direction of what the patient participant gets out of participating in some of these kinds of studies and some of the new tools that we've built to try to get better understanding about uh, people's genomes and, and trying to find ways of getting that information back to them. And, and then I'll talk a little about the future. So all right, the RDC vision. Um, so, so this is sort of our canonical kind of leading slide. And, what we've done at the RGC is we've tried to look across the full spectrum of what one can do in genetics. That is, everything from very large general population projects, we're sequencing on the order of 500,000 people with the UK Biobank and uh, GSK, all the way down to individual family studies where you have you know, one kid with a very serious, very clearly genetic disease, and, and, and sorting through those. And, and, and the concept is, these aspects of genetics, the very large studies that can get you an association between a particular gene and a phenotype, the individual family where you can drill down very specifically on a very specific, very rare phenotype and understand very clearly what that particular gene does in that particular individual. Um, we want to create an environment where these projects can all interact with each other, where we're, we're collaborating with everything from big to tiny. And then when we make discoveries in big, we can then go back and look in the smaller cohorts. Similarly, when we make discoveries in individual small Mendelian disease cases, we can look for the impact of those variants or va similar variants in, in uh, similar genes uh, in larger cohorts. So the idea is take the whole spectrum of genetics and try to use it to, to drive better understanding about the genome and then use that understanding about the genome to drive drug development. So I just wanted to drop this slide in. This is the announcement of the, of the UKB project. And, and, I, and, and I do want to just say one quick thing about the, the UK Biobank. It is a phenomenal resource because it is going to be public. And this is something that is UK Biobank's decision, right? Like, we're partnering with them to sequence, uh, but this data ultimately will be available to everyone. They've already made available the genotype data for 500,000 people, along with the phenotype data. We've already seen that have a lot of impact. And as we sequence more into the exomes and as that data rolls out, I think this is going to be maybe the world's most important data set in genetics for the next 10 years. It's very exciting to be part of it. Um, so. What, what do we have, really, at, at the RGC? It's essentially taking the standard playbook of large-scale sequencing and applying an automation perspective. That's kind of the secret sauce of what we've done. So a fully automated biobank, fully automated library prep. In other labs, people may have hundreds of staff in the lab. We have tens of staff in the lab because instead of having individuals pipetting, we have robots doing everything as much as possible. That's fundamentally important for scalability and cost. It's also fundamentally important for data because the data is much more uniform when the data is prepped by an automated system, and that enables some things like putting the data together more cleanly. It's easier to harmonize the data. Um, of course, we have an Illumina fleet for sequencing. Uh, don't hate the player, hate the game. That's just how it is in the field right now as you're doing Illumina. Uh, and then, of course, given that we're all here and, and we know uh, the, the value as, as DNA Nexus customers, we've, we've, we were really the first large-scale sequencing center to make 100% commitment to the cloud and, and heavily supported by DNA Nexus and AWS. All right. So 
joke slide that I, I just love. So at one point at Regeneron, uh, someone pointed out that we needed to have a cloud in the room, so we got a fog machine, and then it set off a fire alarm. We don't have the fog machine anymore. Uh, but 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 this is this is the picture I like to show to, to explain to people. We really we really are 100% cloud. We don't actually have a data center for the RGC. There's data centers at Regeneron, and you know we can put a server here or there, but I, I have no way of, of of buying computers and racking them locally. Instead, this is this is our infrastructure, and I'm not going to kind of belabor this. Do I have yeah? So uh, we've got the Nexus platform, which is of course the the place where kind of all of the traditional you know, going from a BCL file to a VCF file workflows happen and all the data sharing happens. We also worked really closely with the Nexus team and others to build what we like to call the Annex, which is this piece that allows us to sort of spin up virtual data centers. We can essentially hand to a statistical analytical genetics person a, a, a server in the cloud that can talk to the uh, data assets on the DNA Nexus platform. They can develop new tools and do new things. Um, all this communicating back to us at Regeneron across uh, uh, dual redundant direct connects. Um, all right, so that kind of is a high level on the RGC. Now let's get into the stuff that's actually really exciting. Uh, so I, I, I just wanted to throw this slide up because uh, this paper actually published on BioArchive, I guess, two days ago. Um, this is work that Jeff Staples has been working on over the course of the last uh, maybe two years. And the thing that happened was we started sequencing the Geisinger cohort, right? This is Central Pennsylvania healthcare system. They have, when we started, I think they had six or 80,000 people in the freezer. And we just started sequencing, sequencing, sequencing. And immediately what we encountered was these people are a lot more related than any other genetic study that has ever been done in the history of the world. Like these people have enormous numbers of first and second degree relationships as inferred by calculating identity by descent. So basically just looking at people's genomes, doing the all by all comparison of each possible pair of people in, in the data set, what we saw is the number of individuals who had a first degree relationship you can see here in the red line was growing rapidly as we were sequencing more and more. And now that we're up to about 100,000 samples, we already have over half of the people in the data set have a first or second degree relationship with another person in the data set. So, so just think about this. This is half of the people have a brother, sister, mom, dad, cousin, aunt, uncle in this same data set. That is uh, truly unique, but the, the, the point of this paper and, and the point of this work was in recognizing that, that was not going to be unique for much longer, that as people are sequencing more and more into populations, as they're sequencing more and more into healthcare systems, you will encounter this relatedness. It's, it's just a simple fact of the matter that people go to the you know, healthcare system they live near. Families go to the same doctor because they have the same insurance, and so if you start sequencing through healthcare systems, you will get all these relationships. And historically, genetics just would exclude them. So what, what, what you used to do back in the days, you would make this plot. So this is IBD0, essentially the fraction of the genome that is shared between two individuals that has no similarity. This is the fraction of the genome where they share uh, essentially uh, one chromosome in common. Um, and plotting this way, you get a nice cluster here around uh, 0.5. Actually, it's sort of hard for me to see from there. It's about 0.5, 0.25. Uh, for siblings, then here are uh, parent-child relationships. You have monozygotic twins here because, you know, they perfectly share uh, both copies of both chromosomes. Um, but at the end of the day, what you would do in previous studies is you would sort of lop off everything that wasn't purple, right? You would say, well, I don't want any first degree. I don't want any second degree. Some studies might even have excluded third degree relationships. I don't want any of these things because that taints my statistical assumption of independence. I want to assume that every single individual is truly unique and distinct than every other individual, and that's just not how it works. In fact, you know, what we're seeing is we've got, you know, 2,200 nuclear families, we've got uh, 1,800 trios, a, a ridiculous amount of relatedness in this data. But instead of approaching it as a problem, instead of saying, well, if we have all this relatedness, what are we going to do with it? The statistical analytical methods aren't going to work. Uh, we said, well, let's embrace it. So this is one of my absolute favorite plots. Uh, so this is uh, what, we're, what we're calling family webs. So this is essentially a bunch of black dots that you can't see because the picture is so dense, a bunch of red boxes that are actually first degree families. So this big red box here is a roughly 35 individual first degree network. 
and then each individual in this master network, the, both within the black dots and the red boxes, is connected by blue lines by their second degree relationships. So you can say this person maybe has an aunt which connects them to this person, who has an uncle that connects them to this person, who has a cousin, who has a, you know, a brother and that is connected to this, right? So you can traverse this network um, in a variety of different ways. One of the most interesting things to us is to cut it down into these familial subsets. So we can reconstruct individual pedigrees, we can reconstruct trios, we can reconstruct quartets, and use that information to most importantly, at least for this presentation, uh, phase these genomes and understand uh, compound heterozygous knockouts. So as a drug discovery effort, we have focused a lot on looking at knockout variants. We want to find, you know, instead of making a mouse model, let's look in the human model. The human model being the individual who has a, a gene knockout, and if you're walking around and you're generally healthy um, and you have a, a gene that's knocked out, then, you know, you know that, well, okay, in principle, if I knock down the function of that gene in a person uh, who has a normal genome, uh, that may also then uh, not cause significant problems. So the idea was we were finding a lot of knockouts by looking at, you know, genome annotation and identifying variants that are, you know, truncating a gene and, and looking for homozygotes, but we knew we were missing a lot in terms of uh, compound heads, cases where you have a different variant on one of the copies of the chromosome than the other, but they both are uh, conferring loss of function. So in this, in this study, this is just taking all of those relationships, identifying all of the possible compound hats, identifying which are in cis and which are in trans based on the relationships, then allows us to say these are the genes that are impacted by rare and deleterious compound hats. And you see, of course, most of the genes carry very few compound hats. There are a few genes that carry very many of these compound hats. And lo and behold, if you look at these uh, PLI tolerance scores, this is basically a score that tells you how uh, robust the gene is to mutation. Usually it's, it's you know, basically a, a stand-in for how important the gene is for you to live. Uh, but the point is, the, the, the genes that we see accruing a very large number of these compound heads are exactly the genes that you would expect to be accruing a very large number of compound heads. That is, this doesn't really have much functional consequence because these genes are not that important. And so this was, an, this was kind of an immediate validation that this is working. Um, and then the really exciting thing is because, you know, we're in the accrual of knockout business, right? We are trying to find these unique individuals who have interesting genetics that can model the biology that we want to then make drugs to. Um, tweak, uh, this, this allowed us to go from cases where uh, w we had, I guess, what is it, nine homozygous knockouts, uh, or sorry, we had nine genes where we had more than 25 carriers of homozygous knockouts. Once we included what we're calling biallelic knockouts, that is both compound hets and homozygous, uh, this increased by 189%. And so you see that we, this is allowing us to dramatically increase our collection of individuals who are knocked out by leveraging this family information. And one of the themes that's going to come throughout this is really fully exploiting our data. One of the things that we focus a lot on is if we're going to make this data, we don't want to leave anything on the table. And so this is another example of where we've gotten really, really deep into the technical side of what we're doing, but it's because we want to squeeze every little last drop of juice out of this great data set that we have. And so this is actually really helping us like that much more with the data we already have build bigger collections of knockouts. So then this is, this is a plot we like to sort of uh, talk about and, and, and think about a lot. So this is across uh, the full, well, this was when we hit 200,000 earlier this year. We calculated this across all 200,000 individuals. We sequenced that's Geisinger plus Tai Chi plus a whole bunch of other projects. Um, and the point is, in terms of the number of autosomal genes affected, we have basically every single gene has at least one person in our collection who has a heterozygous knockout. Now, that's not necessarily that interesting. There's a reason why people have two copies of everything, right? Redundancy is good. So uh, it's more interesting to get to the homozygotes. Well, we already have 23% of all genes have at least one homozygous knockout carrier, and we're starting to get to places where, you know, we have more than five homozygous knockout carriers for almost 9% of genes. So we're going we're gonna to leverage this. This, by the way, does not yet include the compound hat. So this is going to get that much uh, that much better, allowing us to basically go gene by gene, create collections of individuals who are knocked out, and then look at their biology and try to understand uh, what we can use those insights for in terms of drug development. 
And so I, I wanted to add this because I, I, I think this is a particularly cool thing that, that we're doing that people may not necessarily be aware of. Um, so given all of these knockouts, how do we actually figure out what is interesting? Well, again, in terms of not leaving anything on the table, we didn't like the idea of only asking the questions that we knew to ask. So we have a pre-computation perspective. So we basically do what we call all by all association calculations. We take every single variant we have, we take every single phenotype we have, we take every single gene burden that, that we think is relevant, that we can create, and we calculate all possible associations between them. So currently it's around, I think, 23 billion results, which of course gets a little bit difficult to mine. But the point point is, by accruing all this data, by computing agnostically everything that you can possibly compute, then it just becomes a matter of a query. Then when an individual wants to know, well, I saw a presentation where, uh, you know, gene uh, PCSK9 maybe has some relationship to LDL. Well, how do I know that? And you can go and search in this massive database of associations and see. It's not perfect. Some of it's messy. You see there's a lot of decision tree in here that you're not intended to read that's mostly about, do you use, you know, uh, the FIRTH algorithm or do you use M uh, MMAP or whatever you know, the statistical geneticists like to argue for days and days and days about these things. But if you make reasonable judicious decisions, you can uh, create a, a data set that you can really mine. So, okay, so that was the sort of drug development side of what we do. I wanted to get into the, uh, the, the piece where it, we can start to think about what, could, what can come back to the patient. What, is, what can we do with precision medicine? So at a very high level, um, chromosomal abnormalities are something that most people don't really ever get characterized for. And, and the reasoning is pretty good. It, it, I think it's relatively expensive to do uh, like traditional karyotyping. And if you have a, a dramatic chromosomal abnormality, you usually know it, right? It's not something that should be a big surprise to you. Um, but one of the things that we wanted to do, again, with the theme of trying to squeeze all the juice out of the orange with our data, is we thought with the exome data we had, we could actually create a tool that would allow us to essentially scan everyone we ever sequence for any chromosomal abnormalities. And the way this works is basically we look at the read depth, we look at allele balance, and then we identify anomalies uh, in, in the combination of read depth and allele balance. So allele balance, just to orient you, like, at one, these are people who have, you know, 100% of the alleles are uh, variant. At zero, 0% 0 of the alleles are variant. Your normal diploid individual will sit here with some variants at 50-50, some variants, you know, that are homozygous uh, alt and some that are uh, homozygous ref. Um, but then you get these things if you have abnormal chromosome dosages, if you have, like, let's say, a, a trisomy, then you might see uh, variants that are appearing at the two-third or one-third level. So um, we basically uh, spent an enormous amount of time thinking about the way to properly normalize this data. This is where the automation really helped us because our data is very uniform, and so uh, normalization across a large number of samples was actually quite effective. Um, and then, we, and, and then we, we literally make these, these plots for everything. So you, I'm going to show you sort of chromosome by chromosome plots, but every individual will have a plot made for every single chromosome. So, and, and this is sort of how, how, how we tend to read these. So, this is an example of uh, tetrasomy X. So, this is an individual who has four different X chromosomes, right? Um, and in this example, you see they have variants that, and we, it's a mirror image, so we actually only look at the bottom half. But they have variants both at, uh, you know, 0% allele fraction, at a quarter allele fraction, at a half allele fraction, three quarters, again, a mirror of that, and one, again, a mirror of that. And so this immediately tells us there, there's something unique and interesting and different about this individual, the fact that they have um, this, this quite unique stratification at one quarter, uh, indicating that they have tetrasomy X. Then we, and, and I'll show you on these other plots, we also calculate a local median, not just a median across the chromosome, and we'll flag regions where there's runs of homozygosity as well, because some of these abnormalities actually don't show up in dosage. So um, here's a trisomy 21 example, where you can see on most chromosomes, of course, it's a bit noisy, but you see there's this nice uh, stratification where you have, like, um, you know, this, this is the zero and the 50-50, and here this is at a third. So you see we're coming down off of the 50-50 line, which tells us that we don't just have two chromosomes in play, we actually have three, and then we can go into the medical record and validate, yes, this individual does in fact have Down syndrome, they are a bona fide trisomy 21 case. 
Um, here's an example of something that you wouldn't normally think of seeing. So this is a copy neutral change. This is uniparental disomy. This is where essentially uh, through some error in uh, replication, you get two copies from one parent of a region or uh, of an entire chromosome, as opposed to one copy from each parent. Uh, it's a problem because then you have these large runs of homozygosity. So this individual, I mean, I, what is this, chromosome 5? Uh, most of chromosome 5 is homozygous in this individual. Well, again, having two chromosomes is a good thing. Uh, people who, who have this level of homozygosity tend to, tend to have serious health issues. Um, here's just some other examples that are kind of neat. You can see how you can see uh, subchromosome level deletions. Um, here's some copy neutral stuff. Uh, the point is, these are now plots that we are giving over to the Geisinger Health System, and the Geisinger Lab can then look at these and make decisions about what they're going to report to people. And I wanted to particularly mention sex chromosomes, because it's incredibly interesting to me, the diversity of sex chromosome complement, and I think most people don't realize this. So here's, here's a spectrum of, of chromosome X anomalies in females. So we see everything from mosaic X loss, which actually happens as you age. So this is something that can be um, somatic. We also see germline X loss, so this is known as Turner syndrome. Um, uniparental disomy on X. We see a little bit of everything. But the cool thing is when we go and we do this accounting, we go across all of the people in Geisinger. This was on uh, the first 60,000 individual sequence. What we find is an enormous number of individuals who, in their medical record, have none of this information. So many of these people, the 31, uh, 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 t uh, what is this, Tetrasme X, the uh, 16 uh, Kleinfelters, the XYYs, many of these people don't actually know that they have abnormal sex chromosomes. And it's probably only going to ever present itself in them as some kind of fertility issue. And right, fertility is such a black box for people anyway. There's, you know, they might get a test and eventually find out. But one of the cool things is uh, our frequency of observation of these things actually tracks with the things that have been reported previously in the literature. So just within this one study, just within Geisinger, just as a thing that we're doing to try to squeeze all the juice out of the orange of the data, we've been able to reiterate the expected rate of, ab of sex chromosome abnormalities that have been previously published. Uh, and, and what we find is, uh, at the end of the day, in terms of non-mosaic changes, about 1 in 625 people has abnormal sex chromosomes. And, and I don't know what fraction of these individuals actually would have as part of their care that reported back to them, but I guarantee you it is not everyone. So there are a lot of people running around out there uh, with these relatively interesting complements of sex chromosomes who, who, who really, honestly, they just, they, they just don't know this. So that's a kind of early story in terms of how this data is reaching back to patients. Geisinger is still trying to figure out how to process all that data, figure out what uh, you would report to patients. There has to be, of course, great care taken in how this data, which is research use only data, gets validated clinically and then gets into a clinical report. I did want to talk just briefly here at the end about the things that Geisinger is actually directly doing to get stuff back to patients directly. So um, this is a slide. I think this is from Mike Murray at Geisinger. Uh, but Geisinger is going through all of the data that we give them and reporting variants back in a variety of genes. So this is what they call the Geisinger 76. So this is the reportable genes from the ACMG catalog as well as some additional genes uh, that Geisinger has identified as reportable. Um, and, and the thing that's really cool is there's, there's a, a large number of people who are getting reports back where there is no history of these kinds of diseases. And this, this covers everything from you know, BRCA variants, uh, Lynch syndrome variants. There's I, I, I think the guys in your web page, if you're interested in seeing exactly what they're reporting, you can go to their web page. Um, but 3.5% of uh, the, the participants, on, as they're rolling through this, look like they're going to be getting some kind of genetic report back from this. And here's one particularly cool story. So this is Barbara Barnes. Um, she's been very kind in letting us talk about this publicly. Uh, basically found a BRCA mutation. Uh, she had no idea that she had this mutation. Uh, and, and this really uh, led to a, a significant change in her treatment. So they found stage one cancer in a fallopian tube. 
Uh, she's completing chemo with expected excellent outcome. This is something that, that honestly may just not have been found if it had not been for this study. So, so these are the kind of stories we, of course, live for. You know, this is a, a, a sort of an ideal case where you know, you know, something was found genetically that really directly impacted a person. Um, but this is what we are reaching towards in terms of working with our collaborators towards uh, precision health. So, all right, so for the future. Um, so the RGC, we are humming along at a roughly 200,000 exome a year pace. Uh, we're very, very excited. We're digging into the UK Biobank now. Um, as we are digging through that, uh, that data will be rolling out uh, publicly. Uh, with the first data freeze that will roll out publicly will roll out, I believe, sometime next year. Um, and, and it'll be very exciting to see how, how the field reacts to this expanding data set where there's all this phenotype data um, and, and as well as all the uh, exome data that we're generating. Um, we are continuing to try to innovate as well as mine our data as effectively as possible. So we have a lot of presentations and publications. Jeff Staples' paper that just hit BioArchive. We have some other papers coming soon from my lab. Um, we have something like 30 or so uh, posters and talks between us and our collaborators that are presenting RGC data at ASHG. So if you're going to ASHG, uh, please take a look uh, at the stuff we're presenting. Um, in terms of genomic-driven drug discovery, I stole this from David. Uh, you know, William Gibson said that the future is already here. It's just not very evenly distributed. Uh, I am very lucky to be in a place that uh, has an unfair share of its allocation of the future, let's say. Uh, but I certainly look forward to the uh, allocation of the future becoming more evenly distributed as uh, large-scale computation and automated association calculation and mining that we're doing is happening now. Uh, I, I, I see that that's something that you're going to start seeing more people doing this already. Some resources on the UK Biobank genotype data that are reaching towards this as well. So, so these things are going to start, I, I think, echoing throughout the field. And then, you, you know, the very cool stories of this data really being deployed directly into clinical care, and it's a bit of a question about, you know, what is precision medicine and, and how is it going to play out? I think it will, it's clearly something that will help. It's not going to cure everything. Uh, but it's an important part of the future, and of course, um, all of us, and I know all of you, will continue to try to use computational innovation to improve health in any way we can. Um, so these are the people who, who did all the work. Uh, particular thanks to Jeff Staples. I can't find his, it's up there somewhere. Uh, Jeff Staples, who, who really did the relatedness work, and Evan Maxwell, who did the uh, karyotyping stuff, uh, and I have time for questions. Great. Thank you. Wow, that's just, I love it. It's so cool. It's so exciting stuff. It'll be very interesting what uh, Geisinger decides to do about those, um, uh, um, the trisomy data, because they right. weren't consented, my understanding is they're consented for the Geisinger 76, but perhaps not for unexpected chromosomal abnormalities. I, I, I believe that they have a strategy for getting through IRB, some reporting. We've already, with some of the things that we've done in CNVs, I know Krista Martin and her group, who does a lot of clinical work with CNVs, uh, are working on a protocol that will allow them to report back uh, clinical uh, reportable CNVs in individuals who do not have uh, anything in their current electronic medical record that looks like it would be an indication of that CNV. And, and that's very sensitive because some of these things oh gosh, confer, yeah. uh, let's say, intellectual disability. And so if you don't have that in your EMR and someone calls you up and says you have the CNV, uh, you know, that's a little sensitive. And fortunately, uh, Geisinger has built up, in addition to everything else, one of the best bioethics teams with Michelle Mayer yes. and other people. So if anyone's well equipped to work through that. Um, let me just take one question from the audience. You got, someone must have a we question have, about have here, view so. of the future. Yeah. Wait, 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 let me just give you the mic. Uh, awesome. Introduce yourself. Yeah, my name is Gang Wu. I'm from St. Jude. And, uh, I think your analysis is able to find the consanguinity. I wonder how you return the, pro the result to the uh, patient. Or this is something very sensitive, and you know. Yeah, yeah. So, so we are a research use only sequencing shop, and we uh, don't, for the most part, sequence our own samples. Ninety nine point whatever percent of our sequencing is with partners, and so our collaborators are the people, uh, and honestly, they're the very best people to be the ones having contact with the actual patient. So, for example, Geisinger, you know, they're the they're the healthcare system that's caring for these people. We give the results to them, then Geisinger does a clinical validation, and Geisinger has an entire reporting strategy. We also have a, a lot of research collaboration, so we work with people like Wendy Chung uh, and 
Uh, in those cases where uh, they're, you know, these, these projects are purely research, of course, that data doesn't always get back to the patients. But uh, it's, it's really a collaboration with the people who have contact with the patient who do the, who do the reporting. And the, the thoughtful return of uh, and the, um, uh, how, to, how to think this through and do it effectively was really part of the research design and the vision from the very, very beginning. And even before the project, I mean, Geisinger was collecting consented data with permission for recontact a while ago. So yeah, this was something Geisinger has been pl working on yeah, for like I mean, 20 years. So it's yeah. really, it's, um, it's funny. When I, after I was here for the first year, I, um, I wrote a piece called, like, that says one of the first things I learned about the experience here was the concept of vision dating. How you know you go out with a vision, you try to find other people who have a vision, and you try to find a match. And what, what I guess actually the three of us did with uh, DNA Nexus and Geisinger and Regeneron is really a good example of that, of three sort of visionary organizations that have been able to find this common ground. Oh yeah, no, we, we totally swiped right on you. So. Yeah, you go. <laughs> <laughs> All righty, well on that, on that note, um, thank you, Jeff. Thanks everybody. <laughs>